My name is Brian Widener. I'm a former neo-Nazi skinhead. Not only did God change me physically, he also brought love into a world of hate and violence. When my relative introduced me to being a skinhead, I was 14. We were called Soldiers of the New Reich. I was beaten up a lot just because I was a skinhead and it was a predominantly Mexican area of town. So violence was a very, very common thing and you either get hard or you die. And that was, that's the rule, that's it. Brian Widener came from a broken home. Raised by an alcoholic grandmother, he learned from an early age that he had to take care of himself. So I learned how to hate. I started getting tattooed at about 14, 15. Um, the tattoo thing was just to signify the whole tough guy look. Oh, I got swastikas and stuff when I was like 16, 17. I got them more for shock value because I really didn't understand the politics behind them. I just knew that they got me in fist fights quite often. So that was why I put them on my body. And after that, that's when I decided, well, I should probably know what they're about. And that's why I started hitting libraries and studying on them and this and that. That's when I started getting into the politics of everything before it was just, just to piss people off, honestly. Eventually, I decided Albuquerque wasn't the place for me and started, started traveling around the country. I uh, met my first hammer skin out in Indiana. They're known for being the most notorious, the most violent, the, the, the biggest, the baddest, the elite, basically. And um, when I met these guys, that's what I wanted to be. You know, they were just... They were organized, they were tough, you know, it was just like everything any skinhead, you know, just would want to be. When I got into the hammer skins, a lot of the guys had facial tattoos and their hands done. And, I mean, I had my hands done, but I ended up getting my neck done and just uh, just for the uh, shock value of it, when it started creeping up onto my face and getting that done, we were pretty uh, out of control. When the gang disintegrated, Brian and former members created a new gang called the Vin Landers Social Club. We started spreading like like a disease. I was in charge of going to different towns in Indiana and setting up chapters, I, and I was I was an enforcer. As a skinhead in my early years, my thinking was very much the white race was the master race. Um, after my first decade, I didn't really see it that way anymore um, because I just knew so many white people that were just such scumbags that I couldn't say, okay, every white person is so much superior than every black person. When, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing complete opposite. I kind of realized the only thing I had achieved in my life was a bunch of scars, a, uh, you know, a legal record, and a, you know, halfway cirrhosis of the liver. That's it. I have achieved nothing else in life, nothing positive. I was actually literally trying to drink myself to death. I was just looking for a way out. I was done. I had given up on life. I'd given up on everything. I was just done. I was sick of the violence, but I didn't know any other way to be. If I would have talked to anybody about those feelings, they would have called me a traitor. And then they would have, they, I would have been branded as such and probably shot. So I just, I just bottled it up and drank. That's all I did. Brian was depressed and on the edge of suicide. Then he met Julie. I, I just fell in love with her. After we got married, we, my, my former gang got real jealous of the fact that I got married and moved 10 hours away because I was no longer available for their business. I was, I started to start working full time constantly to put food on the table. Right before my, right when my son was born, the president actually gave me an ultimatum to choose between them, or the gang, or my family. So I chose my family, and you know he said, "Okay, that's fine. You know, let's give you a proper retirement. Just mail in your patch," which I did. And but it wasn't that simple. Death threats started immediately, and they never stopped. People would, you know, call up three o'clock in the morning and talk about how they're going to kill me and kill the kids. And for years, Julie and I lived literally on red alert. I would, we'd take turns staying up all night with ball bats and stuff, and just wondering when they were going to kick in the door. It wasn't a matter of it, it wasn't a matter of if. It was just a matter of when. I, I knew these guys. I knew what they were capable of. And I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty tough guy. I can handle myself pretty well. But against seven, eight guys, there's nothing. There's, I, there's nothing I can do. But for some reason, Julie picked up a Bible one day. It was this old German Bible that she had for years, a little antique one. Just started thumbing through it and reading it a little bit and showed me a couple prayers and uh, just a couple, like a serenity prayer. I started saying that just to keep, just to calm myself in the mornings because we were just, uh, just being curious more than anything. And uh, we went down to Tennessee for Christmas one year and uh, my father-in-law just to go visit him for Christmas and my father-in-law took us to his church. It's a Southern Baptist church out there and something happened. But the thing was, Julie felt the same thing. 
And I think it was almost at the same time. I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but you know, she looked at me, she's like, do, do, did you feel that? I was like, yeah, we, you know, we're, we're, we gotta do something. So ever, as we, uh, we started praying at that point and um, praying and praying and reading the Bible. And we, we uh, actually made a promise to God. It's like, if you help us get out of this alive, we'll give our lives to you. And uh, within a couple of months, we were able to move to Tennessee. And we did, and first thing we did was we gave our lives to God, <laughs> because there was no way I could have done it by myself. Once, once I was able to accept Jesus in my life, I was able to actually smile again. I was able to enjoy a day. I was able to be polite and be happy. I, I was able to enjoy my children. I was able to just enjoy things. And he did that. I, you know, he, when he filled me, it filled, it put, it, it patched the hole that was always leaking. And I mean, it's, it's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. Well, when I, when I changed inside, when I just, when I was, my sole concern was my family and it was no longer about my race or about violence. I had to look every day in the mirror and see this thing that I actually made myself. I got to realize that just what kind of a monster I was actually projecting to the outside world. With the past lingering on his face, Brian's desire to live a normal life seemed hopeless. I mean, I'd, I'd go out to job, I'd go out and try to get jobs, and yeah, nobody would talk to me. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences were always a mess. I mean, it was just. It was an absolute nightmare. And I started looking into laser removal, which was entirely just way too expensive. There was no way I'd ever be able to afford it. So I started looking at means of actually uh, using dermal acid and burning them off my skin. And I was just gonna just go ahead and suck up the burns. In a desperate move, Julie contacted the Southern Poverty Law Center. With their help, they located an anonymous donor and Brian began a painful two-year journey of removing the tattoos. It was absolutely amazing. We ended up doing a Q-switch laser out in Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Bruce Shack, he had never seen anything like me before <laughs> walk through the door or, because I, I mean, I just had so much coverage that he's never, he had never ever taken on something like that. And physically, it was incredibly painful. It took about 23 to 25 treatments, but everything that's happened has been just literally a miracle. Uh, the removal, my family is safe, we are safe. Uh, we, have a, we have a beautiful home, I'm working. And it wasn't my doing. I didn't do any of this. You know? I'm barely a high school graduate. You know, I'm not really anything. I'm a former street kid. God has done just miraculous things in my life, and now and I can finally give glory where it's due. I can finally give Him the credit.